Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. This is Eric. And I'm Nicole. We're broadcasting today from the physics department at the Colorado School of Mines. So, Eric, what are we covering today? Well, today we're going to crack open Chapter 2 of Cattell, and we're going to develop a general theory of diffraction. Oh, hold on. What do you mean by diffraction? Yeah, that's a good point. So with diffraction, we're thinking about how an instant wave interacts with a sample. We're going to be able to learn a lot about the sample and how the sample distorts the wave. So then our goal in this episode would be to determine some sort of mathematical expression for a scattered wave intensity at our detector? Exactly. Great. Well, I already know how to build plane waves mathematically and how they interfere with each other, like in the double slit experiment. So am I good to go? Not quite. It would be good to be comfortable with Fourier series and Fourier transforms. If you're not, there's a video for this week that covers that. Fair enough? Great. So in physics, we love making assumptions to make math easier. What assumptions can we make here? There are going to be two critical points coming into this that we should be aware of. First, we're going to treat every collision as elastic. So no energy exchange is going to occur between the wave and the sample, right? Right. Second, we're going to assume that our sample has a scattering density, n, that depends on the spatial arrangement of the atoms within the sample, and we describe that spatial dependence using little r. So if we draw ourselves a chunk of sample, let's define our origin at some point here. We can then define a position at any point within the sample using the vector little r. Exactly. It's also worth noting what kinds of samples we can analyze with diffraction. Using this technique, we can analyze everything from crystals with long-range macroscopic order down to glass, which has no translational symmetry whatsoever, and anything in between. So basically anything we can think of. Precisely. So now that we've set up frame of reference for our samples, let's walk through an actual experimental setup of a diffractometer. Well, obviously, we need a wave to interact with our sample. We'll thus need some sort of source that spits out radiation in spherical waves. How about, at some capital R vector away, we'll have our sample. In this case, capital R is significantly bigger than little r, and this lets us assume that our incoming wave is a plane wave once it becomes incident upon our sample. Because we made this large capital R approximation, we can also treat the vector of wave propagation, k, as parallel to capital R. Perfect. So now that we have a plane wave incident upon our sample, we want to know the amplitude of our wave at any point, little r, and any time t within our sample. Using the plane wave approximation, we're going to need to figure out the wave's phase term. We need to remember that the phase differences come from both spatial and time sources. Yeah, yeah. So our time term would just be the frequency of our source times our time variable t, and the spatial term comes from k dot little r. You're almost there, except for the path length difference. Don't forget the k vector has traveled the extra capital R, and that should be included in the total path length traveled by the wave. Oh, OK. So in the path length difference part of the phase term, it would be k dot capital R plus little r. Exactly. And so we arrive at an expression for the amplitude of the incident wave at any position r within the sample at any time t. Great. Now once our wave comes in, we can assume an absorption and re-emission model. And by doing that, we'll be treating each point as absorbing the incoming radiation and then re-emitting it spherically, kind of like our source does. And the tendency for the sample to scatter an incoming wave at any position little r within the sample is determined by the scattering density that we mentioned earlier. So here's one for you. Can you determine the amplitude at the detector from a wave emitted by point R? Well, first we need to determine where our detector is. So let's put it here at capital R prime vector away from our sample, as so. Now let's see if we can build up our amplitude piecewise. First, we know that the amplitude at our detector will depend on our amplitude at the sample. Second, we'll have a scattering density that affects the amplitude. Great. Let's treat this point R as a spherical emitter in the sample. So the wave will also have a spherical decay that goes as 1 over the magnitude of capital R prime minus little r. But assuming capital R prime is much bigger than little r, we can simplify this term as well. What's nice about this capital R prime approximation is that once again, we're going to treat the wave at the detector now as a plane wave. 
Cool! So I can use the same complex exponential setup, but this time for the path length difference, we'll use capital R prime minus little r. But this is nasty and complicated, so let's do some rearranging. So after some rearranging, we can now say that the amplitude at the detector is going to be proportional to our sample specific scattering density and the change in wave vector as dictated by our source and our detector. Okay, so now we have these two wave vectors to worry about. Can't we just smoosh them together into one term? You can, and we call that delta k, or k prime minus k. Love it. So are we done? Well, not so fast. This expression is for one particular position within our sample. To get the total amplitude, we need to integrate over the sample volume. This brings us to Patel 2.18. So diffraction phenomena really occurs within this integral because as we're summing over all the possible exit waves, some will constructively or destructively interfere to produce a final net amplitude at our detector. And you know, one really cool thing to notice is, you know, with the integral, we can just say that our amplitude is the Fourier transform of our scattering density with respect to the change in our wave vector. Well, this is sort of useless. My detectors measure intensity, not amplitude. See, that's no problem. Intensity is simply the absolute value of the amplitude squared. This also gives you experimentalists a real value to measure. Unfortunately, measuring the intensity will result in the loss of any phase information in our wave. Well, Nicole, this seems like a wrap. We've got a general expression for intensity at our detector for a given configuration of delta k and scattering density n, just like we promised. So let's end this screencast with some questions regarding the physical interpretation. For instance, what sort of allowed waves can be used for the source? I mean, can I just throw puppies at our sample? Second, our radiation source typically produces incoherent radiation. So how does that work? Third, can an inverse Fourier transform give us back our scattering density? And finally, what space do our k-vectors exist in? Until next time on Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, NJ signing out.